Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tullamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. Good evening and welcome to Country Life here on Midlands 103. MJ Cleary with you for the next hour. Bring you the latest from the Midlands and further afield from the worlds of agriculture, food and agribusiness. And good evening. And it has been a while since I've been able to say welcome to a sunny, warm evening. God knows how long that's been, but it is a beautiful late spring, early summer evening. And thankfully, for the first time in a long, long time, I'm able to talk to you about the good week of weather we have just had. Uh, Absolutely glorious over the past few days. Sunday especially was just what we needed. Excellent for body and for mind. Uh, Forecast into next week is staying dry. And uh, look, the one caveat is it's cold at night. A little bit more kindness needed for grass growth. What super tillage weather it is at the moment. As I was coming over to the programme this evening, uh, tractors moving everywhere. We're seeing one passes, land levellers, ploughs, you name it. And a real bit of respite for tillage farmers now just coming at the right time. I know, look, it's it's a week or 10 days later than you would like it, a month later in, in all reality. But we're getting it and uh, crops will be in in the month of April, which is the most important thing. So thankfully, some respite for farmers uh, ac- across the board, be it beef, sheep or dairy, all animals out, fertilisers out. Lots of slurry been spread in the last week as well, again later than we'd like, but we're getting it out and that is the main thing. So uh, fingers crossed it uh, lasts us now into next week. And as I said, just a little bit more kindness needed for grass growth, but we are on the right uh, path. Uh, also this evening, we will be speaking about a number of different issues as usual here on the programme. In a moment, we're going to be chatting to Conor Ryan, CEO of Arabon. The co-op recently announced their financial results for 2023. We're going to cover that in just a sec. Irish Farmers Journal are on the road at the moment. They're bringing their renewable roadshow around the country where people can learn all about the options that are available to them in the renewable space. Next week, the venue is at loan and Stephen Robb will join me later to give particulars of the event here in the Midlands. An apple a day keeps the doctor away, something we have heard for years and years. However, if you're eating an apple from an Irish supermarket, then there's a 90% chance that it is imported. With the apple market worth well in excess of €100 million, Chagas believe there's huge potential for Irish-grown varieties. Dermot Callaghan from Chagas will join me later here in the programme to chat about this. Uh, I must say, actually, on that topic, it was something that sparked my interest this week and I had, no pun intended, I had some sparkling Irish apple juice in a coffee shop a couple of weeks ago and I commented to myself just what a a simple and flavoursome product it was. And uh, when you hear figures like that, that uh, over... It's actually, but I think it's about 92% of apples are, are imported. Uh, it is interesting just to see what the take on it is and how Irish growers could get a piece of that huge, huge profitable market. Now, talking about uh, markets and local markets, something I've been meaning to mention to you for the last number of weeks is it's been running now for a couple of months. There is a local market in Burr, uh, County Offaly, where I'm from, every Friday morning. It's running from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's in Singfield Industrial Estate. Uh, so it's on the uh, the cemetery road out of Burr, as we would say. But if you pop it into Google Maps, you'll see where it is. But two, three minutes out from the centre of Burr. And uh, there's lots of local produce available there. There is bread over from Abbey Leaks. There is a uh, fishmonger. There's also uh, Fergal Dunn here from Tullamore. Uh, you'll know his um, his brand, Pigs on the Green, doing black and white pudding. It's available for sale there. There's also uh, fresh veg and fruit available. Uh, pastries, pies, you name it. So if you are in the vicinity, try and give it a support. It's a local market, lots of local producers there and uh, it's only getting going so it needs as much help as it can get. It's on every Friday, 9 to 2. Uh, Towards the end of the hour here in the programme, we have a leash and offly double header, much like the GA over the last couple of weeks. Marion Mulhall from County Leash will chat about an upcoming organic farm walk and Anne-Marie Manley from County Offaly will speak about the Emerald Expo. It's a big dairy show taking place this weekend in County Cavan. Now, if you have anything to say to me this evening or you want to just tell me that you're working out on the tractor and you're uh, listening to me here over the course of the next hour, I'd love to hear from you. Text or WhatsApp 083 30 10 103. As I said, we're starting off on the subject of dairy this evening with Connor Ryan. He's the CEO of Arabon joining us on the line. Connor, many thanks for chatting to us here on the programme. Good evening, MJ. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak with you in this program. Thank you. Uh, uh, more than welcome, Connor. Uh, 2023 results announced as of last week. Look, it was always going to be nigh and impossible to follow up uh, 2022, but 2023 proved a strong year, uh, no less for the co-op, a very strong year, in fact. Yeah, 
No, I think we were probably the only co-op in the country to surpass our 22 results. Uh, but we, listen, sometimes you, the ball hops right for you, MJ, and yeah, a number of things came right for us last year. It was a very volatile year. Milk supply was strange, and that is reasonably strong up to the end of October, and then died of debt for the last 12 weeks. And commodities uh, were relatively, you know, came from a very high the previous year, and, and it was a matter of managing your business downwards and not to get overexposed. So this environment today is a uh, there's a lot of ups and downs in it, and uh, you know people need to. You obviously take the long-term view and, and work your way calmly through it. So we had we had an exceptional year, but it wasn't without its challenges. To be fair. Uh, looking at the figures, Connor. So uh, farmers, uh, especially, well, all business people will uh, will like to uh, get a, a bit of an insight onto this. Your turnover went down, but your operating yeah. profit went up. So your turnover uh, figures here in front of me, whether they're, they're bang on or not, getting them online. Uh, turnover in twenty twenty two was five hundred five million. Turnover in twenty twenty three was four hundred three million. So a sizable drop. Yeah. But offer, operating profit then increased by twelve and a half percent. So farmers, would love to know, uh, Connor, how do you increase profit uh, when turnover comes down? Well, very, very simply, MJ, Twenty the previous year, you, you, you had dairy products at record prices. You had fertilizer and feed at crazy prices. So, you know, it was inevitable that our turnover was going to drop. But I think it's how you manage the piece in between, which is the challenge. And for us, managing the piece in between is ensuring that we buy and sell uh, in favor of our business. So... Buying, you need to buy your energy right. You know, in in our game, energy is a big expense for us. If we went back three or four years ago, we, we'd have looked at a seven or eight million bill probably for gas and electricity. At the height of the peaks, we were looking up at 30 million. So, you know, we, we, we managed those markets exceptionally well. We, we managed them down very well. Also, we didn't get exposed on buying the likes of fertilizer or feed inputs, which, you know, this year was quite the opposite. We, you know, we saw fertilizer coming off all through last year, no matter what fertilizer had, it was dropping in price every month. We saw 12 price drops within about 12 weeks at the start of last year. But we, we didn't overexpose ourselves. We bought as we need. We'd make sure we'd product available for our, our customers. But you could take a massive hiss if you overexposed in any of those key areas. And fortunately enough, we didn't. We, we didn't take positions and we let the market find its own niche and you know, we 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 develop in a business that's not so reliant on the commodity markets to some extent. I mean, they're always affected by it, but that that gave us good protection. MJ, that was the reality of it. So, you know, we got our energy piece right, we got our our, our sales right, and we didn't overexpose ourselves on the, on the feed and fertilizer inputs. Uh, and we were allowed to give our customers good value and and uh, make sure we had what they needed. So it was as simple as that. There was no magic to it. Just uh, hard work and uh, working our way through it and making sure our suppliers got the best milk price possible all year and best value and inputs. That's, that's, our, that's our game. So. Yeah, well, speaking on milk price, I'm going to talk about your reduction of debt in a moment, Connor. Speaking on milk price, looking here at uh, 2023, so your average milk price last year was just over 43, so almost 44 cents a litre. And obviously, look, the previous year, as we said, 2022, that uh, unicorn year, as we call it here in the programme, was almost 60, yeah. 61 cent in 2022. But if we remove 2022 from the equation just for a moment, uh, last year's milk price was the highest of the last. The graph in front of me is the last seven years. It was the highest you've paid yeah. uh, in any other year. So it was it was a good milk price, like 44 cents. It's a, it's, a, it's a very good milk price. I know the inputs are, are the problem and are the killer at the moment, but it was still, it was it was a strong milk price. Second highest milk price ever, MJ. Mm. Put it in perspective. It, 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 it was. And let's be honest about it. You know, in our wildest dreams the previous year, we never have seen that milk price was going to go to those levels. You know, people took fixed milk price contracts. You know, in my head, if we saw a milk price between 38 and 40 cents, I, you know, you, you get very excited. Mm. To think it went to where it went was just incredible stuff. So, yeah, that that was excellent for dairy farmers on the year that was in it. But listen, I left them with a lot of challenges the previous, the following year with tax bills and all that. So, you know, half the high comes the low at times. So, you know, you have to you have to work your way through it. And, you know, but yeah, it, it was a very good big price. But at the start of the year, fertilizer was still up at a thousand euros a ton. Feed was probably two or three hundred euros a ton dearer than ever it was. Electricity was still at a very high level. Diesel 
but all those costs kind of came back during the year to a greater or lesser extent, which, you know, and it's about managing that margin, that piece in between for farmers and for ourselves. So, you know, it's a milk price today is very, it's extremely volatile. Uh, and uh, if, you know, from our perspective, every day we spend a lot of time trying to ensure we're, we're, we're well positioned and not oversold or undersold, but to the, to the very, to very volatile market, unfortunately. Yeah, and one thing you're doing uh, to ensure you're not overexposed is reducing your debt level. Again, every farmer, dairy farmer, beef farmer, whatever type of farmer you're doing, uh, nobody wants to be overexposed because bad times can come. You were 45 million euro in debt in 2019. Uh, that is down to just over 10 million euro. So you've paid off 35 million euro in the last four years. Uh, from any business perspective, like that's that's great going, and that's I suppose look where it's where you want to be in any business. You want to be paying off your debt and uh, making yourself resistant to the volatile markets yeah, that is in the game. co-ops ultimately we're farmer owned business exposure to massive debt really isn't where we need to be you know uh, we have to be able to ride out the turbulent times we had no choice but to borrow money we were in a different era it was all about milk expansion we had to put in capacity we had to be making sure we were able to handle milk so we had to borrow money. We're not comfortable borrowing high levels of money, but then we were fortunate enough the decisions we made were the right ones and have left us, you know, with a relatively low level of debt. But it was, you know, we were at our AGM in Nina last Friday and one of the questions that came up from the audience, and our auditor explained that our balance sheet was very conservatively balanced. And one of the lads asked him the question, like, why would you not go and revalue your properties, etc.? By the nature of our business, we can be ambitious for our business, but I think around our balance sheet and our debt levels, we always have to be conservative. You know, we we'll make decisions on the basis of a thousand dairy farmers out there. They have college fees and fluctuating milk prices. So at all times, whereas we like to be doing our best and driving forward, the core of the business must be stable and, and you don't need excessive debt, as particularly in the last couple of years with high interest rates. So we, we were conscious of trying to get that debt level down at all times. Uh, one thing you did was an extension to your Dan O'Connor Feeds Mill. People will know that brand. It's a brand in itself now. Not, yeah. A lot of people don't actually even realise it's owned by Arabon, but it is a brand in itself to Dan O'Connor Feeds. You see the lorries driving around the country. Did a €3 million Euro extension to that in 2023. What did you do uh, uh, there, Connor? Was that a complete overhaul or were you just uh, fixing up existing we, we, premises? We, we had two feed lines there, as we call it. And we put in a third one, 16 ton an hour of feed line there. And in fairness, the business is about 150, 160,000 tons. So it's a substantial business of a very small platform. And we have covered it over the years, working excessive hours, working Saturdays and Sundays. And in fairness, their workforce in there, they've always been willing to, to, to turn up and do the job for us. But, you know, at times then we ended up buying products externally to, to give us support to heights in the market. So we had a plan for a while to, to put in that capacity and that was put in on time and on budget and we're very happy with that investment so uh, you know it, it, it's a very decent business in there and well located just on the edge of Limerick City with good access right up into Galway or out into Tipperary or up in Daffoli or down into North Cork so we you know we, we do a good business out of it it's a good name and a good reputation going back many years so it was well over it was a long time overdue MGA Fives to be absolutely honest about it you know, we should have done it a few years previously, but listen, with a lot of other stuff going on in the business, so uh, it was about wait for the right time to spend the money, basically. Do all the different strands of the business uh, stand up on their own, uh, Connor? Do you ever need to go from, uh, does one need to uh, help out the other one? For example, the fees, are they profitable on their own? The notes, I presume they are. Are the stores profitable on their own? Do you ever need to, to move money across yeah. to ensure they, they stay tipping away? Obviously, the milk is profitable. Uh, are they all standalone sound, or sometimes is there is there movement across? Uh, no, no, listen, both our, we, we combine our stores and our feed business into what we call our agribusiness, and, and we treat that as a business unit, and then we have the industry, the ingredients business, which is a separate business. They are both separately profitable. Uh, listen, we have stores, some of them are exceptionally good stores, more than you might be making a whole lot of money out of them, but they're important in their locality. Mm. So, you know, they provide, it's not about making money sometimes in those stores, they're there for generations. They might be the only thing left in a parish or a region. You know, we, we, we would be kind of religious enough about making sure we keep them open and viable. 
so I wouldn't say every one of them is making the fortune, and yeah, but they have a role to play. It might necessarily be about making big money for us, but some of them, listen, some of our stores are exceptionally good, like Sadat and Rai, Nina, the store board, the Diesel store, Bursley Kane, up in the Kilimer. We have other stores that are more out in the periphery and wouldn't have the wouldn't have the footfall, but that's not to say that they don't play a role for us. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, uh, and it's yeah. it's nice to hear that as well, Connor. It's not all about uh, the bottom line. And uh, when you're look, you're dealing with a co-op, so um, you know that's the that's the model, and and that is that is nice to hear uh, when you're talking about the countryside and giving a, an outlet for people. Connor, I'm going to say many thanks for uh, joining me. Uh, great success there in Arabon last year, and uh, long may it continue. Many thanks, Connor. And yeah, and my pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Cheers. And that was Conor Ryan, CEO of Arabon. And uh, a very good year there for the co-op, even though turnover went down by 100 million, uh, operating profit went up 12.5% to just over 10 million. And as Conor said, uh, the reason that was was because they bought wells, bought their energy contracts at the right price and they were able to ensure to uh, counter costs, I suppose, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the absolute letter of the law. And uh, really everything can be taken in context in your own farming business if you think to yourself look if my turnover goes down I'm definitely not going to make as much money not always the case you know you could add value to the product products or produce you actually have say for example if you're a beef farmer and uh, maybe you're rearing calves and you're selling 100 a year and you're only making 200 a calf that'd be 20,000 if you suddenly got into higher value animals maybe some suckler cows and you, you bred at a very high level and you're only selling maybe 30 animals a year but you were selling them at you know 400 uh, euro a head margin you could in, in actual fact uh, make more money doing a, a different enterprise so that is what we always have to be conscious of it's not all about turnover and uh, that's what Arabon's uh, results showed us this year also it is nice to hear that uh, the small stores I know a few of them as you're driving around and you would say to yourself uh, they're not that busy and uh, sometimes maybe older farmers might pop in for a chat or to see somebody uh, they're in rural areas and uh, even if they are not standalone profitable they're still part of the network and uh, it's nice to hear something like that especially keeping rural Ireland alive now moving on to an ad break and afterwards we're going to be talking about apples and as we said an apple a day keeps the doctor away but 9 out of 10 of them are brought in from abroad so Chagas feel far more apples can be grown here in the country let's hear about all about that in just a moment Country Life on Midlands 103 brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tullamore supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands worshaw.ie and you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103 now we're moving on to apples and we have Dermot Callahan from Chagas on the line Dermot many thanks for taking my call this evening Hi MJ nice to talk to you uh, you're more than welcome, uh, Dermot. You're head of Chagas's Horticultural Development Department, and uh, an area you feel that we're missing a trick on here in Ireland is uh, apple production. Can you give us a bit of background on this, please, Dermot? Yeah, well, look. Uh, last week we would have announced uh, we would have had the first research update from a newly established apple research program in Oak Park in Carlow. So, really, what we're we're trying to do in that research program is to develop um, some new models of production for the Irish system and for the Irish climate. Um, we understand that there's a, a retail market worth 135 million euros uh, and over 90% of that market for eating apples, 90% of that market is imported. So there's, there's a lot of headroom there for more Irish production. We believe there's 30 or 40 million euros worth of potential there in terms of more Irish production, but it will rely on getting uh, new, new systems of production and adopting new varieties and technologies into an Irish scenario. Were we always importing this amount, uh, Dermot? 90% is, uh, it's, a, it, it's an awful lot. Uh, back in the day, did we grow more apples here in the country? Yeah, look, it, it, it all happened, I suppose, with the change in how people uh, have, uh, you know, the shopping habits have changed. And not over 90% of all fresh produce is retailed through five multiples or five supermarkets. So they have international arrangements for sourcing fruit and veg, and they would have taken in a lot more imports over time since the 70s and 80s since that model kind of has established, you know. Yeah, I suppose it's the, therein lies the problem, isn't it, uh, with the supermarkets, the power that they have. Uh, for uh, people involved in horticulture in general, we, we speak uh, to different horticulturists on the programme here and you see the numbers are, are dwindling in all the sectors. Uh, if you speak about broccoli or cauliflower or whatnot, I think it's a handful of growers now for, for those in the country. Uh, there obviously are the people... Um, producing the 10% of apples in Ireland. What are we talking about? Are there 2, 3, 10, 20 people uh, doing this, Dermot? 
Well, there are about 15 or 20 growers who are commercially uh, sized and supplying supermarkets with Irish apples, but the volume is pretty small in the overall context. Um, I think I think overall uh, the opportunity will be around trying to understand, if you look at New Zealand or North America, you see all the new developments that have happened in the last 30 years, where you have higher density apple orchards planted in very favourable and uh, conditions, um, right varieties using the right system of production. Some of these systems that we're looking at have the potential of delivering 80 or 90 tonnes per hectare in terms of output. So uh, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at uh, modern systems of production, you know, to to um, increase the Irish share. I think also what's important is the research programme is looking at consumer sentiment. So consumers out there have been used to gala from France and, and Pink Lady and so on. And we're looking to, to look at varieties that can meet those requirements from a quality perspective. Uh, so that's one of the key parts of the research programme, that it's not just a case of of planting trees and testing them in the field. It's also road testing those varieties with the consumer, with the marketplace. So it's very much a market-led development here that, that we're, we're, we're looking at. I'm probably asking a silly question. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer, so I suppose it's not. Uh, when it comes to picking apples, can, is there a machine to pick them or do they have to pick by hand? Well, again, these systems are, are they're fruit wall systems. They're, they're, um, so they can be robot ready. There are robots in development in the Southern Hemisphere currently. And we would like to think that the systems that we're looking at at the moment will be robot ready when the robots are available and when they're feasible in terms of, uh, you know, we can make those investments. But at the moment, there is quite a lot of automation associated with picking. So uh, pickers are basically working uh, with two hands and everything else is taken care of. So there's automation, conveyor systems uh, and so on to increase productivity. And these systems lend themselves to that system very, very easily. Uh, are, can it be profitable, uh, Dermot? Um, apple farms, orchards, can 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 uh, guys make money out of them? Well, it's all about expertise. Like any enterprise in farming, it's about uh, you know knowledge and understanding exactly what to grow. And what we're trying to do is, at the moment, if somebody came came in and said, you know, what variety should I plant? What density? How should I grow it? What market should I sell into? And so on. What we're trying to do is get all the answers to those questions so that we make the proposition investable for farmers or for growers who want to, to look at this seriously. So it'll be about having all the knowledge to hand. So, you know, um, and then you can you can kind of work the numbers out and understand what the profits are. But currently, we don't know uh, what, how certain varieties will perform in a certain system in Irish conditions. So we have to be the guinea pig and do that work. And then we will package the proposition and roll it out in a couple of years' time when we have that information. But I'd like to believe that uh, uh, and we think that the, based on the systems as they perform abroad, that yes, there are there are profits to be made here. You would see on a smaller scale, Dermot, often at, uh, mentioned the farmer's markets at the start of the programme, but you would see at farmer's markets regularly uh, bottled apple juice from uh, a small organic farm. Um, and it is definitely an area where the smaller producers add value to their, to their business by doing something. I know it's not what you're talking about, you're talking about large scale and guys getting into this in a big way. But uh, to be able to see people doing it on a smaller scale shows it does work and shows there's a business model there. Yeah, look, uh, the existing apple growers um, have some of the most successful farm shops and farmer markets in the country um, uh, because the apple lends itself very well. There's not a piece of the apple that's wasted currently. So if you have 90 or 95 percent, which are graded as class one into the fresh market, everything else can be outgraded and it can be used in cider, juice, um, even Calvados, which is apple brandy. Uh, We've seen all sorts of products being made and even the pomace after pressing the apple is used in confectionery or can be used in confectionery as a food ingredient. So like the valorization or the, the every piece of the apple can be used and is used currently. So it's it's definitely um, an area where we can maximize the return, hopefully, for, for, for producers in the future. The apple cider vinegar is one that's definitely on trend at the moment. Dermot, you're seeing it uh, more and more, especially health food shops and whatnot. It's, uh, it's, a, real, it's a real product now that's being pushed uh, globally for people who are interested in health, gut health and whatnot. Yeah, it is. Uh, apple cider vinegar is obviously uh, on trend at the moment. Uh, a few years ago, it was NFC or not from concentrate apple juice. So the juice you mentioned at the, at the top of the programme, uh, that was very much in vogue. So there are trends and fashions, obviously, around nutrition and so on and gut health. And I think, obviously, uh, cider vinegar is, um, is um, you know, around uh, many, many years. We've heard about the, the benefits in terms of gut health. 
um, you know, weight loss, etc. All those claims are being made. I'm not sure about the scientific basis for some of them, but uh, we definitely hear a lot about them for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's an interesting area, uh, Dermot. Nice to shed a bit of uh, light on it, something a bit different here on the programme. And we're going to say many thanks for joining me here on Country Life, Dermot. And uh, we'll speak to you again. Thanks, MJ. Take care. All the best. Uh, that's Dermot Callahan there from the Horticultural Division of Chagas and a huge, huge, huge market there for apples in Ireland. Well over 135 million. I said over 100 million started the programme. 135 million and uh, just when you hear that the five supermarkets uh, basically control it all, that's the issue, you know, uh, especially for the growers who are currently doing it at the moment. If they are to scale up, then that's fine. Uh, they go and take the risk on the investment, on the equipment, on the labour, on all of it. And then you stand there and you negotiate with these buyers in these large supermarkets who uh, really just look at the bottom line. And if the figures don't add up, they just don't care. And that is the problem with the power of the supermarkets. That's why I'm pushing the likes of the farmer's market, that one in Burr and your local farmer's markets. If you can try and buy locally and just move away from the supermarkets for as much as you can, it really does uh, funnel back down to the local economy. Uh, now, coming up after the break, we're talking to Stephen Robb from the Irish Farmers Journal. There's a renewable roadshow in Athlone next Tuesday. We're going to hear all about that in just a moment. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractor in the Midlands, wwarshow.ie. And you're very welcome back to Country Life here on Midlands 103. And as I said before the break, we are moving on to the area, the very hot topic of renewable energy. And I have Stephen Robb from the Irish Farmers Journal on the line. Stephen, many thanks for taking my call this evening. No problem, MJ. Good to be here. You're a busy, busy man at the moment, Stephen. You're running these renewable road shows. There's four of them throughout the country and you are in our own hinterland here next week. You're in Athlone next Tuesday night. It's the Athlone Springs Hotel and it's kicking off. Uh, doors open 6.30. It's kicking off at 7.30. How are these being received around the country, Stephen? I'd say you're absolutely mobbed at the moment. Yeah, look, we, we've been uh, we, we've had an exceptional turnout now at the previous three events. So we went to to Cork at the start of the month, then we went to Kilkenny, and just yesterday we were in Coothill in Cavan. And you know we're seeing we're seeing attendance numbers of, of three fifty to to four fifty plus, like um across you know per night across the uh, each location. So even even though the weather picked up from Kilkenny onwards, and you know, especially last night, you know the weather was so good. Uh, we st- we're still seeing the turnout, which really, really shows the the appetite for information out there amongst farmers uh, and businesses and homeowners. Because there were there were many businesses and homeowners uh, in the audience over the past three events as well, not just farmers. Yeah, as you say, the appetite is huge. It's just it's such an on trend uh, topic here at the moment. It's everywhere you look, and you have the event is divided among four sessions and uh, it's broken down then into little um, smaller sessions within each. We'll just talk about the headline sessions and obviously if people are interested then they can attend because you're not going to be able to get much info across the line over the next five minutes here but you're going to be able to give an an overview. Session number one, um, Stephen, is getting paid for making renewable heat. Layman's terms, what exactly are you talking about there? Yeah, so really we're talking about um, mostly biomass is what we're talking about. So biomass boilers, um, there's a really good scheme in place uh, at the moment called the Support Scheme for Renewable Heat, SSRH. And it's designed for for any farmer or business who uses heat um, to switch from uh, uh, fossil fuels, uh, so hot oil or diesel or whatever, to, to renewables. So whether it be biomass or or other sources, and you get paid. You get paid for up to fifteen years for the amount of heat that you produce to use on your own site. Uh, it's it's a three hundred million euro scheme, and there's, there's still two hundred and eighty million euro available. So it's it's there. It's there for the taking. It's designed for for farmers and businesses. Uh, and we run through uh, with the, with the Arbia with Sean Feynman, the CEO down to give us a talk on that. We run through the scheme, how it works, uh, and put it in in context with some real life case studies. Right, okay, very good. And again, as you said, only uh, 20 million drawn down and I'm reading yourself week on week and I'm keeping an eye on everything. I hadn't heard about it. So um, it shows you it's so much stuff out there at the moment. It's so hard to keep on top of everything. Uh, Session two, you're talking about making sense of solar PV on your farm. This must be probably the biggest uh, amount of questions at any of these events, I'd be guessing, because solar PV now has just been pushed, pushed, pushed. Uh, What exactly are you going to be covering in that, please, Stephen? Yeah, absolutely. That's our by 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 a long shot. That's our most popular session. Um, really, you know, high amount of questions and queries from from attendees. 
Uh, we have Chagas Barry Caslin down giving us a talk. Um, just a, a, everything you need to know around solar PV for your farm uh, and your household business as well. Um, looking at the systems, looking at the types of technology that's out there, types of panels, really centering heavily on, on the grants and the available grant aid um, that's out there uh, and how to, how to go about, I suppose, uh, availing of it. Then we run through two real life case studies um, of, of solar PV systems installed on a dry stock farm, a dry stock tillage farm, uh, at a dairy farm. So two kind of offices, one low energy user, one high energy user, and it's real farms, real data provided by our partners, IFA and Board Gash, uh, and for the event. So and that that's you know really putting bringing to life everything that we're talking about uh, and showing how it can work. And we also run through some of the options then for, for bigger projects, you know, whether it's an export uh orientated project which you know you, you want to install on your farm or develop your farm or indeed if you're intended on on leasing some of your land to, to solar farms to wind farms battery energy storage systems etc we run through kind of some of the typical values you're expected to you would be expecting to get from some of the developers so uh, it, it's there's a lot of information in that session there's a lot of information in the whole night but uh, certainly that that one has proven very popular yeah, very good. Session three, retrofitting your farmhouse. You don't have to have farmhouse here. If you move the word farm out of this, you'll probably get 10,000 <laughs> at these events. Uh, this is, again, room to improve on this season. We see um, retrofitting of houses occurring now, older houses, the uh, the grants available for all of this. Again, massive, massive area trying to fit it in here. But uh, the fact that it's the, it's the farmhouse, uh, big interest, I'd be guessing, again in this one, Stephen? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Look, farmhouse, uh, you know, Rural house, um, or even house and house in the state. Um, you know, we're we're seeing all all types of homeowners attend the event uh, to learn to learn just just that. You know, what's actually out there, what's available, and and how do you go about um, availing of it? So, look, most of them are centred around the the available SEI grants, of which there are plenty. Um, but we we'll also touch on the vacant homes grant, um, which is proven popular for, for maybe some farmers who would have you know a derelict property on on the farm somewhere well you can go up to seventy thousand to do that up and that's there's been quite a bit of interest around that as well and um, and then uh, obviously just just today we had the announcement of the at long last the low cost uh energy efficiency scheme i think it's called um designed specifically to 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 provide low cost finance to homeowners who are uh, embarking on an energy upgrade uh journey by by uh availing of, of some of these grants and whatnot so look that's that's been the big, the, the big game changer we've been waiting for uh, to really see this whole area kick off. And, and that's kind of what we cover throughout the night. Has there been, just on, on that uh, low cost, is there any figures on that uh, yet, Stephen, in relation to interest rates or have they been announced yet? I suppose it'll depend on the lenders. Uh, it would depend on the lenders, but we're here and it could be in around 3.5%, oh, very good. Uh, which yeah. is exceptional. Yeah, you know, that's very good. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that is, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what we need. Last one, Stephen, just in a word, I'm going to ask you to do it in 45 seconds, anaerobic digestion <laughs> and farming. How will it work? Now, you learn your you learn your wages tonight, go. Yeah, absolutely. So look, hearing an awful lot about anaerobic digestion these days, I run through what it actually is, what it actually means for farming and where we think that it's going to go in the future and, and how to get involved. And that's it in a nutshell. Lovely stuff. Well, Stephen, look, you're going to be very busy next Tuesday evening. There's going to be lots of our listeners here going over to you at Lone Springs Hotel. Doors at 6.30, starts at 7.30. It's free entry. Booking in advance, if possible. Go on to irishfarmersjournal.ie uh, and you'll find the details there. And uh, Stephen, we will speak to you again on the programme. Many thanks. Thank you very much. All the best. Uh, Stephen Robb there from the journal. And I am just going to shoot straight to a break because we are under time pressure and I want to get back to speak to Marion Mulhall and Anne-Marie Manley. So stay tuned for that. Country Life on Midlands 103. Brought to you by W. Orshaw Burlington Business Park Tillamore. Supplier of New Holland's tractors in the Midlands. Worshaw.ie. You're very welcome back to Country Life on Midlands 103. In a moment, I'm going to be talking to Offaly woman Anne-Marie Manley about the Emerald Expo taking place this weekend in County Cavan. It's a dairy show. But in advance of that, we have a organic farm walk next week and advisor Marianne Mulhall from County Leash is joining me. And we're going to pop over to Marianne in just a second. Anne-Marie Manley, many thanks for joining me here on the programme. Hi, MJ. Thanks very much for having me. You're more than welcome, Anne-Marie. You were on holidays last week because I made contact with you and I asked you to bring back some nice sunny weather for us and uh, you managed it, Anne-Marie. So I have to say on behalf of myself and all the listeners here in the Midlands, many thanks. 
most welcome anytime. Um, you were uh, you, you definitely did what we asked. We're having a bit of fun with you last week. I said bring it back, and you must have brought it back in the suitcase. And Marie, you're back on track now. You're dairy farmer in County Offaly, but you're also involved in the Emerald Expo. What is it, uh, pray tell? So Emerald Expo kind of goes back to the days of the RDS Spring Show. Traditionally, there was always a spring dairy cow show and beef cow show up in the RDS. But when that all finished up, some volunteers got together from the farming community to keep the spring show theme going and they called it Emerald Expo. So this is actually the 12th edition of Emerald Expo and it has been in a few different locations such as Killen Hill in Kilkenny, Punchestown in Kildare and more recently it's been in the new show centre in Virginia in County Cavan. Yeah, very good. And it's a, look, it's a huge event. There's a load of different uh, classes. It's taking place this coming Saturday. One of the areas that's very nice in these events, and a lot of the shows we're doing it now, is the Young Handlers event. This is how you're kicking off the uh, the day. And then you have lots of different um, uh, categories throughout the course of the day. Uh, will people be coming, Amory, from the locality? We're County Cavans, look, Westmead here, only across the, uh, across the way. Or do people come from all over the country to a show such as this? This is actually a national show. It draws a crowd from all over the country. You've got Cork, Kerry, Wexford. Um, you sometimes have people from Donegal, Leitrim and every other county in in the Republic as well. So it's a great, it's a great draw card. And um, for farmers, much like the future of your herd is in your young stock, the future of showing is also in the young people and getting people involved at a young age is really important and that's the benefit of the you know the young handler classes and these opportunities for me I grew up going to Tullamore show that's my local show so every weekend during the summer we'd be off at different shows and I was showing calves and it's instead of going to GAA matches we were going to cow shows or agricultural shows all over the, the country so it's a brilliant hobby to have and it's a good social outing for farmers as well. Yeah, you nailed it with the social outing. And Marie, look, we all know everyone involved in agriculture the last eight, nine months have been very, very, very challenging. This spring really was a tough one for everybody. And to have the sun shining, which it will be this coming weekend, and to go and see fine, fine stock and to be chatting to your colleagues and your peers, uh, it will be a lovely day out. And there is a big, big social uh, aspect to these shows and it's something we can't forget about. Absolutely. And, you know, one term we always had was it's your show family. You know, you meet up with your show family at the weekends or you meet up with the people you're always seeing at shows and like-minded people that have an interest and a passion for breeding cows and, and for coming together with a healthy bit of competition now, mind you. Of course, everyone's <laughs> exactly. driving to get the red rosette, but whoever wins gets high compliments because it takes a lot to turn a cow out to become champion of a show. A lot of things have to fall into place. It's not just what happens on the day. It's all the preparation that goes in in advance. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's uh, going to be a big, big, big event it's taking place this Saturday. It's in the uh, Cavan uh, Sequestrian Centre, Amory. Is it in Cavan? No, no, it's in the Virginia Show Centre. Virgi- yes, yeah, sorry, that's, uh, that's uh, you took the words out of my mouth. The Virginia Show Centre, I had it written down here. And uh, that's taking place. Roughly what time are doors open? What time can people attend? Um, Judging should start at about 10 a.m. with the Young Handler classes. And um, people will be able to wander around and look at the animals being prepared in advance with safety of animals and people forefront. And um, then the championship should be, depending on how quick the judge is at making up his mind on the day, it should be at around two o'clock or three o'clock in the day, the main championship. There will be other championships, like the Young Handler Championship will be early on in the day. Lovely stuff. Well, Manny, thanks for coming on and giving us a word about it, Anne-Marie. As you said, Virginia Show Centre this coming Saturday, Emerald Expo, and uh, no doubt you're going to have a big turn up. Manny, thanks, Anne-Marie. Super, thanks a million. And I just would like to say that um, everyone's welcome to come along and look, and even if they're not able to come this time, that they should check out their local agricultural show going forward, especially if they've got kids interested in doing some showing, because not always... Um, they mightn't have access always to, to show calves, but farmers are always willing to get anyone involved if they have the interest and share the passion.
Exactly, well said. Many thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, Anne-Marie Manley there, as I said, the Emerald Expo taking place this weekend, Virginia uh, Show Centre in Cavan. I'm moving over quickly to Marianne Mulhall. Uh, Marianne, I should say. Marianne, we had you there a second ago, and I don't know, we had maybe a technical hitch, so we have you back, and you're going to talk thanks, to us. Thanks, No problem. Yep. It's an event coming up uh, this day, week, May Day, in County Leash. Can you tell us about That's, it, please, Marianne? Yeah. That's correct. So it's an organic farm walk, um, an organic uh, dairy and uh, tillage farm in um, Arles, Coolanowl Organic Farm in Arles and County Leash. And it's on next Wednesday, the 1st of May, starting at 11 in the morning. So we're just going to be covering really uh, looking at multi-species and the role it has to play um, on an organic farm, looking at growing protein crops. And on this farm, Bill George has put in um, peas and beans along with arable silage crops and, and the combination crops of peas and barley and all in the interest of feeding the dairy herd as much as possible from homegrown feed and that will be a big focus on the day and also then looking at um, the you know the, the importance of clover so, and soil fertility along with looking at the health of his dairy herd uh, breeding and EBI and, and different housing um that he has on the farm. These organic farm walks, Marianne, must be attracting huge numbers now, given the amount of people who have made the conversion in the last year, year and a half. Yeah, they are for sure, MJ. Um, like uh, we're finding that um, really good attendances last year when we hosted uh, seven or eight of them, and uh, we are expecting a, a, a good crowd. There's not many dairy organic farms in the country. And um, I suppose there probably hasn't been an open walk like this in a while on a dairy farm. So I do think it'll generate a lot of interest. But just maybe like to say it certainly is not curtailed to dairy farmers. Um, there is an awful lot of learning. In will, There will be a lot of learnings for a beef farmer or sheep farmer on this farm walk as well. Um, and obviously tillage. And the reason being is because uh, growing grass is really important, the influences of clover and the impacts that uh, soil fertility will have. And they're common across the board, I suppose, whether it's a dairy, a, a sheep or a beef enterprise. And uh, looking at growing crops then to feed animals as well. And again, that's common across for dairy, sheep or, or beef enterprises as well. So it's it's not, I suppose, a pigeonholed looking uh, for a dairy or a tillage audience. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's so much uh, information out there that people need to get their hands on as a result of entering it. And we're going to say many thanks to you joining us. Marianne, it's in Arles County Leash. It's this day week, 1st of May, 11am. And uh, no doubt you're going to have a big turnout. Many thanks, Marianne. Thanks, MJ. And that is it for this evening's programme. Busy line up there over the course of the hour. And we managed to fit it all in uh, barely, but we did. Uh, thanks to Amory Manley. That is the Emerald Expo taking place this Saturday in Virginia. Uh, Marianne Mulhall spoke to us there about the farm walk in Arles County Leash. We spoke to Conor Ryan, the CEO of Arabon at Lent at the start of the programme about their results this year. Dermot Callaghan from Chagas speaking to us about the potential for apple growth in Ireland. And Stephen Robb from the Farmer's Journal. That's next Tuesday at Lone Springs Hotel at 7.30. Thanks to you all for listening. Thanks to all my guests. Shows repeated Sunday morning, 7am until 8am. Get us wherever you get your podcast. MJ Space Cleary, C-L-E-R-Y. We'll be back with you in seven days' time. As always, good night and God bless. Mm-hmm.